Hello, my name is Daniel Schoonmaker, and I'm the Executive Director of West Michigan Sano Business Forum and the facilitator of Michigan's Great Southwest Sano Business Forum. Thank you for joining us for our fifth legislative forum on resiliency and sustainability in Michigan, today featuring Representative John Holdley, the sixth the six district congressional uh, 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 our six district congressional candidates. For those that are not aware, Michigan's Great Southwest Sustainable Business Forum and Michigan's uh, Michigan Sustainable Business Forum are projects of West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum. Initiatives that promote business practices that advance climate leadership, community resilience, social justice, and the creation of a circular economy. This is part of a project that we're working on with support from the Environmental Defense Fund in partnership with American Sustainable Business Council and others to elevate the need for public sector leadership, uh, for public sector leadership, leadership to protect our communities and economy from present and emerging threats, and to provide an opportunity for our current and potential elected representatives to hear about these concerns from impacted business and community leaders. Uh, specifically, our organization is interested in how we can invest in climate resiliency and racial equality and how COVID-19 is currently informing those efforts. Our panelists today include State Representative John Holdley, Simon Rusk, Head Brewmaster of Delivery, Laura Goose, Mayor Pro Tem and Commissioner of City of St. Joseph, Jim Roberts, president of Jim Roberts Enterprises LLC, and Marie Stroud, sustainability consultant of Shinka Sustainability. And last but not least, Marta Johnson of the American Sustainable Business Council. The next hour is gonna go by pretty fast, so we're really looking forward to this discussion. Uh, and now I'd like to turn my screen over to Mr. Holdley for some initial remarks. Well, thank you, and I'm so excited to be here today. Uh, for folks that are joining, my name is John Hoadley. I am currently the state representative of the 60th House District serving Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo Township, and uh, portions of Kalamazoo Township and portions of the city of Portage. I'm currently the minority vice chair, which is the ranking Democrat on the House Appropriations Committee, which means that I'm uh, really involved in helping craft our state's uh, nearly $60 billion budget. And I want to do so with an eye towards uh, protecting our environment and, of course, standing up for our schools, for better health care, for Michigan jobs, and a number of other priorities that people across our state, including here in Southwest Michigan, have been talking to me about. Um, you know, I want to also note that I'm uh, currently the Democratic nominee running for U.S. Congress in the Michigan's 6th Congressional District. I am so honored to be here today. And for folks that don't know me uh, well, you know, my story is one of starting my journey as an advocate. You know, first making sure that I was fighting um, for LGBTQ equality before marriage equality, before non-discrimination protection wins at the US Supreme Court. But that work taught me that when we come together, we can be powerful and that our voices can make an impact in public policy. I then took those advocacy skills at a, to a broader level when I ran for state representative uh, nearly six years ago. And it's been such an honor and privilege to serve in that role. You know, it, my time in the legislature has meant that I've served on numerous committees, including the Michigan Department of Agricultural and Rural, uh, Agriculture and Rural Development Subcommittee on the Appropriations, serving on uh, the Department of Energy and Great Lakes, the uh, uh, subcommittee previously, you know, doing work to make sure that we were that I've got my hand in different portions of the budget and the ways that it impacts our lives. I've, as a legislator, it's, I've had to make tough choices, but when it comes to standing up for the environment, that's been an easy one. You know, I'm proud that I have a 100% voting record on the Michigan League of Conservation Voters Scorecard, the Michigan Sierra Club's Voters Scorecard, uh, and with the clean, Michigan Clean Water Action, which means that I've built a track record that has been advocating and supporting our environment and sustainability. That means things like uh, I've been proud to sponsor or co-sponsor legislation ranging from increasing renewable energy to expanding our bottle build to making sure that we're prioritizing energy efficiency and asking our state to build more in those directions. 
It also means that, as we were talking about previously, that I've got a lot of unfinished business, that Congress should be the best place to do that work. Unfortunately, I'm running against uh, our incumbent member who has been on the wrong side of so many environmental issues. And we absolutely need to have bold leadership to tackle the climate crisis, which we know disproportionately impacts people of color, to make sure that we are uh, promoting and investing in businesses that are lifting up new ways of doing business to create jobs here at home. You know, having run a small business myself, I know the stress of making payroll, of making sure that we can provide health care for our employees. I know what it feels like to be waiting on those invoices to come in because you're worried and you know the responsibility that's in the hand of a small business. I also know then the passion of wanting to do things in a way that is good not only for business, but good for the earth and for generations to come. That's why I'm so excited to support programs that continue to invest in small businesses. And I look forward to finding ways to lift up the voices of small businesses, not only to recognize their good deeds that they're doing, but also make sure that more businesses have opportunities to do the same. You know, I think about uh, local businesses, uh, you know, folks like Calsec that I've watched locally invest in uh, clean energy production, find make sustainability the heart and soul of how they do their work. I am so excited that we're going to hear from Simon later about some of the interesting work that's happening in our brewer section, uh, you know, our brewer industry, because there are ways that regardless of where you're coming into the program, that we can be champions of sustainability. Uh, and so I'm so excited to hear those stories and connect around those issues. But I also know that we as policymakers need to be charting a bold vision and encouraging folks to come with, whether that's 100% uh, renewable energy future, whether that's promoting zero waste opportunity. So we are sending less of our, uh, of our waste to landfills and finding ways to make a complete cycle. You know, whether it's things like mitigating greenhouse gases and working with folks in all of our sectors so that they can uh, invest in ways that are going to not only make them more profitable, but also that work more sustainable. I'm excited about it. That's why I'm running, because at the end of the day, I think that we should put people and community at the center of decisions. Special interests, their voice is loud enough in DC and in Lansing, and that's why it's time for change. And this conversation today is lifting up the voices of people who are not only talking the talk, but walking the walk. And I think it's a great example of how, I hope as folks are watching us online, that they're gonna hear ways that they can apply uh, some of the lessons learned, some of the innovative policies to their own business. I hope that you contact your policymaker at the end of this conversation. If you hear something that speaks to you uh, and you encourage them to then support those types of measures. Because in democracy, uh, we believe in equal justice under law. We believe in one vote for one, one vote for one person. And we believe that all of our voices matter. And so with that, I'm excited to be here today. I'm excited for this conversation. And I'm looking forward to the next great idea of how we can create sustainability here in Southwest Michigan. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, th thank, thank, uh, thank you so much, John. Now I'd like to turn it over. To, uh, turn, uh, turn it over. Uh, turn it over to uh, Laura, uh, Laura Goose, the uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Commissioner of uh, City of St. Joseph. Thanks for having me. It's hard to follow Representative Holdley, uh, but I'll I'll give it my best. So, um, Daniel, the question that you and your team posed to me uh, to try to answer today was how climate has impacted Berrien County, um, and particularly for those under-resourced communities. So I wanna be clear, I'm the City of St. Joseph Commissioner here, so I don't speak for all of the communities within Berrien County, um, but having studied climate change and having uh, a role in leadership for our Sustainability Committee, uh, within the city of St. Joe, I feel like I have a pretty good idea of what's going on in our in our county. Um, so we we know that weather is changing, our climate is changing, and we're getting more extremes. And 
just this year, um, many of the forecasts from three, four, five years ago have come true, right? More severe storms, longer periods without rain, uh, heavy precipitation in the spring. Um, and since I joined the City Commission in 2017, one of the big conversations that we have continually had was water level and water storage. Um, those are two huge pieces for us as a community and I know we are not the only community in Berrien County dealing with this. Um, so I'll give you a couple of examples um, in terms of water management. So water obviously you know we know it comes from snow and rain and all that good stuff. Well historically um, the last 10 years um, water levels have gone from an all-time low or, or record lows in the lake and the rivers to the point where we had to dredge the St. Joe River with help from the Corps of Engineers and that's a shared body of water between three plus municipalities just here at the mouth of the um, of the St. Joe River at, at Lake Michigan. Um, that's a very costly endeavor so it becomes a hot potato of who's going to pay for dredging. Um, is it the city of St. Joe? Is it, uh, you know, uh, St. Joe Charter Township? Is it the city of Benton Harbor? Who's going to pay for this? Oh, great. We can have the Corps help us out only if it impacts the boat traffic. So we are a port. So if it impacts boat traffic, the Corps of Engineers can help us out. But if it doesn't, if those boats can get through, but it's just more difficult for recreation, um, then we can be on our own. So funding for dredging. And then we turned the faucet on, uh, right? So climate change has now brought us into a high watermark uh, for both the lake and all of our rivers and tributaries. So then the question is what to do with that water. We no longer need dredging, so that's great. We don't have to pay for that, but we now have huge erosion issues. Um, not only here in St. Joe, but up and down the, the coastline of Lake Michigan. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that we will see more inland flooding. Um, that will go to anything that's on a riverfront. Uh, so low-lying areas uh, will, will flood more frequently, especially if there's a, a large precipitation event, which it feels very much like we have these long periods of drought and then a deluge of water that basically just runs off because our, our vegetation and our soil can't absorb it fast enough uh, because of the, the hardened conditions. So then that ends up in the rivers, the tributaries, the lakes, and it fills us up. Um, it also poses an issue for storage. So one of the projects that we started, gosh, three years ago or before my time on the commission was um, a containment, a storage project for water overflow. And the original um, proposal had you know, uh, an expectation of storage that we have now surpassed. And so lucky for the city of St. Joe, we had not yet committed to the size that our original study said we should do. We continued to study it. So we actually need to create more water storage because when it flows out of the storm sewers, it needs to be caught someplace so that we can make sure that it doesn't flood and also gets treated properly um, because it picks up road oil and all sorts of garbage from from the roadways so those are two big things flooding erosion i guess that's three things erosion and storage how does that impact communities all of those things cost money so if you're already under resourced then the hardest hit communities are those communities that do not have a high property tax um, uh, they don't they don't have as much money from property taxes so if they don't have that base of property taxes it's much more difficult for them to get the millions of dollars that they need to fund infrastructure projects whether you're talking about roads that need to be repaired because of water damage or whether you're talking about storage of storm water runoff or whether you're talking about lakeshore erosion those things cost money and um, one other uh, quick example that I'll give in real time is this year in 2020, um, starting even when we weren't having major precipitation issues, 
the Main Street Business 94 downtown Benton Harbor was repetitively closed for flooding. Even on sunny, bright days, the river would come back up and flood Benton Harbor on Main Street um, just as you're going towards I-94 or going up towards St. Joe on Business 94. Um, and that is an example of how uh, water can really wreak havoc because we think about the small businesses that are downtown Benton Harbor that people from the other parts of the county couldn't get to because that was their thoroughfare. It cut off, you know, lunch traffic for restaurants. Um, certainly the arts district um, had some difficulties uh, in terms of that people had trouble getting to work. Um, so productivity, absenteeism, those types of things, those all happen because we have a water issue. Um, so I'll move on, just, I'll just pivot briefly to um, lakeshore erosion and riverfront erosion too, because that's a big part of it as well. Um, obviously, that impacts public land. Um, in the city of St. Joseph, our water plant sits basically on the shore of Lake Michigan. So if you go down to Lions Park uh, Beach, our water plant that services not just the city of St. Joseph, but many municipalities in our area sits on the shore of Lake Michigan. And we ended up having to put in an additional half million dollars in additional to our already um, uh, budgeted repairs to the under lake rock revetment because what happened over time is our rocks that support that shoreline that support our water system for a great number of, of uh, residents here in Berrien County uh, the rocks started to slip because of erosion underneath them and that does happen over time what they discovered through studying is it was a much worse problem than they had originally thought and they needed another half million dollars that we had to vote on um, in order to shore up a water system that is used by thousands of people in our county. Um, you can see that if those types of situations happen in an under-resourced community, that could cost them um, their water systems. It could cost many different problems for that community. Um, and then when you look at the private property that is along riverfront and lakefront, people may have inherited a home. I, I could probably tell you 20 different people along our lakeshore that inherited their home. And they, they may not have millions of dollars to create rock revetments and protect their property, or even just, you know, in some cases they go into the lake. Um, and while yes, insurance may help with some of that, it certainly is not um, going to cover the, the real loss. So when you have communities that are in low-lying riverfront areas and there's home loss, then you have uh, people that no longer have a house, no longer have property, and don't have the means to replace those things. So those are issues that can impact. So there's a, an issue with housing. There's an issue with, of course, as I mentioned, roadways and um, municipal infrastructure. And that's just literally off the top of my head <laughs> um, issues that come with this space. So I did wanna just say um, and, and be mindful of the time that we have, um, that the city is doing, city of St. Joe is doing things. We have created a sustainability committee. Uh, we are looking at a great number of goals for our city as it pertains to uh, not only um, environmental quality and all the systems that we just talked about and more, but also we look at the social and financial impact of those same um, same policies and the same infrastructure. So we take a wider view and try to inform good policy within the city and hopefully um, to those municipalities around us that want to know what we've done, uh, we share that as well. So I think I'll leave it there and see if there's any questions, Daniel, I, I over. I think, did, did, you, did you have a question for, uh, uh, for Representative Holtley? Well, I, my question was mainly around, um, we talked a little bit before uh, mm -hmm. about renewables, and I think that one of the things that would help us a great deal, as an example in the city, 
um, one of our overall goals is to have more renewable energy options. But it causes, there are infrastructure things that we can't do uh, because of the way that our renewable energy is provided. So I would just ask at a state level, you know, what are, uh, what are your thoughts, Representative Hoadley, on what municipalities could do and what's really in our power versus what the state can offer? Well, um, you know, I want to start by saying, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I really appreciate all your work. And, uh, you know, you bring up a really good point that from a very broad perspective, uh, the, there is a cost of inaction on climate change. A lot of people are focused on the, you know, what's it going to cost to uh, fix the shorelines? What's it going to cost to look at those new energy upgrades? But the reality is doing nothing has a cost as well. People are losing their homes. Businesses are suffering because of this, let alone the, the health impacts that we know that climate change has caused. The loss of productivity for so many of our farmers and agricultural producers. There is a cost to inaction and we're all paying the price right now. I think one bigger piece that you talked about that I'm really excited is a part of this conversation now is around green infrastructure funding. You know, America is best when we are building, when we are uh, making sure that we're investing in the manufacturing, in, our, in ourselves through infrastructure. You know, when we are building things, moving things, growing things, that's when America is at its best. And Southwest Michigan has been a leader in those conversations. So whether, you know, we're talking about something like Joe Biden's uh, proposed $2 trillion green infrastructure program through other more targeted investments at the state, you know, the reality is that we should be able to partner with our local units of government, small businesses, and other folks who are in the both energy, agriculture, and commercial space, industrial spaces to make sure that they're getting the access to the capital to make those strategic investments that are good for the long term. You know, I will note that, you know, you're talking, I'm just looking at your remarks, coastal erosion, uh, the impact on our, our recreational boating issues, let alone our commercial uh, traffic that exists in the area. You know, I'm thinking about uh, the storage questions that you're talking about. All of these ultimately come down to, do you have the available resources to make the best investment for the community and the environment at the same time? Right now, we are watching as communities across the state have suffered because of cuts to local revenue sharing, restrictive laws that, that have uh, made it so we give away, the Republican-led legislature gives away tax cuts to some of the special interests that then robs funding for our schools and our communities. And we're all paying the price. You know, even recently with the HEROES Act that was in Congress that could have helped us respond better to the COVID-19 pandemic and have that available dollar so we could build back better and stronger, you know, folks like Congressman Upton voted no. So I know that we absolutely need to be leaders in this space. And uh, I'll note at the state level, uh, I mean, we're in budget season right now. We are looking at some, it's gonna be tight. Uh, and so the types of programs that should be available to be helpful for you are potentially not gonna be there. And it's why we need to see some real change when it comes to who's getting the priority in the budget. We, maybe we just can't afford to give away taxpayer dollars to the most profitable, biggest corporations anymore because the stake of our community and our environment um, might need to come first. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Now I'd like to introduce Simon Rusk, head brewmaster of the livery. Who, which was uh, also notably our Sustainable Business of the Year for 2018. Simon will share some of the experiences he's had trying to run a business during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Simon, the, the screen is yours. And you're on mute, Simon. There you go. Yep, I got it. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, John, Laura, uh, thanks for those words. Appreciate it. Um, so <laughs> running a business during COVID-19, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> um, it, it's been incredibly, incredibly challenging. Um, you know, my first and foremost concern at the very beginning of this was my staff members. 
Um, you know, I work with uh, about 23 wonderful people um, who I consider to be my family and I wanted to make absolutely certain that they were safe. Um, and, um, you know, in the end, obviously first that meant about health. Um, and then, you know, kind of shortly after that, I kind of realized, well, geez, economic security is really important as well. Um, and, you know, fortunately, um, you know, with the unemployment insurance that was available early on, um, you know, we were able to keep everybody in a really kind of, at least I would say, uh, secure position, um, both from a health standpoint and an economic standpoint. And now, with those, with those uh, benefits expiring, um, it's a much different uh, kind of a scenario. And we are having to make compromises in terms of what we feel like uh, the level of safety that we're looking for um, versus our economic security. Um, and that goes not only for myself and for the business of delivery, but as I said, for these, uh, you know, for all of my team members. Um, so that's been a really challenging thing. Um, you know, I, I certainly wish that we had had a much more robust, robust testing. Um, you know, we did have a scare here where we had a, a, an employee test positive and, you know, the, the length of time that it took for the rest of us to get tested and get results was, I mean, it was almost insane. It was absurd. Um, we, we should have had much, much quicker uh, test results um, so that we knew that we were doing what we, what we needed to be doing. So obviously that was very, very frustrating. Now I will say that the, uh, the PPP loan was a, at first was not a very great program for my business, but after they made the changes, it actually is a great program for my business. And I'm incredibly thankful for that. Um, I've, I've also been able to take advantage of the, um, the, the SBA um, emergency uh, disaster loan. Um, these programs are uh, literally a lifeline and will keep me in business and keep me a part of this community, which is what, what I want to be. Um, so, you know, we've, there've been some good things, um, but, you know, also, you know, some bad stuff. So, um, you know, we, you know, we're looking at an incredibly un, un, um, uncertain future. Um, I have no idea how long this pandemic is going to stick around. We're, you know, we've been doing outdoor dining only, um, as I said, kind of out of a, out of a concern for safety of my staff members. But you know, the winter is coming, <laughs> um, and it's going to get cold. Um, and I'm afraid that we're not going to be able to have, um, you know, we're, we're certainly not going to be able to do business. And we're coming up against this question: Do we go? Do we go to indoor dining? Um, you know, can we do that safely? Um, you know, I'm looking at obviously ventilation and, you know, trying to make sure that we're, we're going to be able to do this in a way that that works. But, um, you know, as I said, we're, we're now up against this, this question of safety and economic security. Um, and, you know, it, it, they're hard, they're really hard questions, John, there's no doubt about that. So, um, so you know, like I said, with this future being incredibly uncertain, we don't know what's going to happen over the next three months, six months, 12 months. Um, you know, the idea of us returning to what we have done and what we love to do, which is be a community advocate, gather people together, uh, celebrate live music, celebrate local musicians um, and regional musicians. Like we, you know, we, this, this stuff is all, we don't even know when it's going to happen. So I guess my question for you, John, is what, do you have a plan to help us kind of move forward through this, uh, this difficult to upcoming year, year and a half? Simon, uh, thank you for the question. And first, thank you for like your persistence and resilience and sticking to it. Having run a small business myself, not on the same scale you are, um, I know how hard it is and how much pressure is on your shoulders as people's paychecks depend on you. And so other folks who've never been in that seat don't understand that pressure. But I just want to start by saying, I've been there. I know uh, to a smaller degree what you're going through. And thank you for both taking the risk and taking on that responsibility uh, to make this help, to, to do this work. So 
let's start with um, just the unfortunate fact. I know many times in your in your um, your remarks, you were trying to say like, look, we got to have some sort of balance between safety and the economy. And uh, the piece that I want to flag is that it's frustrating that we that we are in this moment at all because what we do know is that uh, the economic plan is when we are safe and what we and if we control the public health pandemic that's going to get people back to work faster it's going to get people spending money in our stores faster it's going to make sure our kids are can go back to school safer we know this to be the case and for so long uh we had no leadership coming out of washington dc um we now found out that uh, in fact we were being told one thing as our president knew another and we even had people like Congressman Upton trying to fight with Governor Whitmer uh, instead of, you know, really prioritizing public health initially so we'd be in a stronger position. And at the end of the day, COVID-19 viruses, they don't know the difference between Republican or Democrat. They don't know the difference between Berrien County and Cass County, Michigan and Ohio. Um, and so we have to make sure that we're taking public health really seriously so we can get back to work and help our small businesses thrive. Now, that being said, um, you know, we absolutely need to see a federal plan. It needs to then continue us moving forward. Uh, and we need to support our strong state plans as well. I will note, you know, I'm watching those COVID-19 numbers, those positive tests start to increase over the last week. And it makes me nervous. Just when people are starting to get back to work, just when they're starting to rebuild confidence, and like you said, what are you going to do about in, in-person dining or not, right? What, what's going to be the plan moving forward? People are going to feel a lot better if our numbers were much lower. And so that's why doing things like, uh, you know, I'll put a plug here, michigan.gov slash coronavirus. You can find a testing site. You can, if you need to get a test, you can uh, look at the statistics. You can report unsafe, predict, um, uh, unsafe working condition, all that uh, over there. But it also means that, I'm proud as a legislator that I've stepped up to try to help with the restart grants to make sure that our small businesses had a little bit of extra capital to then put those pieces in place that'll help you restart safely. You know, I always knew um, for me, you know, as running a small business myself, it was a lot of times it's the great idea and also how are we going to pay for that? And so, you know, those are examples where if we're asking you to step up and do more for um, with PPE for your servers and your employees, that you put up the plastic shields to reduce the incidental spread of, potential spread of uh, the coronavirus, that you've got a little bit of help to do that. It also means that we're gonna have to be really thoughtful and flexible about what those type of programs look like in the long term. And you know, I'll just say one last piece here. Um, you know, with a, with a consumer oriented business, we gotta make sure that uh, we're not creating up undue and avoidable pain, as the federal chairman talked about, uh, unnecessarily so. So when the programs that have helped uh, lessen the economic impact, that helped you know, prevent evictions, that have made it so folks who had to struggle with unemployment um, weren't at a total loss of their income, we need to make sure we continue to extend those programs so your customer base doesn't drop out from underneath you either. Yes. Yes. And so I, you know, I think this is a, like we talked about the big circle of sustainability, right? And uh, we got to be making a 360 approach to getting through the COVID-19 pandemic for our small businesses too. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, you uh, thank you so much, Simon. And uh, as always, we, uh, huge fans, of, uh, huge, huge, huge fan delivery and all of its products. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Jim Roberts. And am I on mute? No, nope, we can oh, good. hear you. Okay, good. I just had a had to check. <laughs> now I'd like to do Jim Roberts, president of Jim Roberts Enterprises LLC. Uh, Jim is going to talk about how the pandemic has been especially hard for businesses led by people of color, uh, and the unique challenges uh, it, it is presenting to entrepreneurs and business leaders in Southwest Michigan. Uh, Jim. Hi there, John. I um, wanted to kind of go over a couple of things that have been out in the uh, press. You know, the COVID-19 pandemic has um, hit disproportionately people of color. 
And, um, you know, when you look at uh, Forbes magazine came out with an article that said just 12% of black and Latino owners who applied for the PPP program um, received money. Um, and nearly half anticipate that they will probably have to close within the next few months. So it's hitting our community rather hard. And then what you saw was that in an article in the Wall Street Journal that um, businesses who got the loans were not the ones who really needed the loans the most. And um, those who, you know, it, it really wasn't based on who needed a loan. It was more based on your banking relationship that you were able to get um, the PPP loan. So then we also had the Center for Responsible Lending um, has predicted that 95% of Black-owned businesses and 91% of Latino-owned businesses um, stand no chance of getting a loan through um, the traditional mainstream banking uh, program. So my question to you is, do you have, um, are you working on anything to support minority-owned businesses and the infrastructure that surrounds those businesses? Jim, I really appreciate that question. And the answer is yes. And I, I want folks who are maybe watching this uh, to just think about those shocking statistics that Jim just said. And you know, noting right at the front that so much of the question of whether you would get that PPP support, whether you would get additional support was determined based on your banking relationship as opposed to the, the worthiness or the need of your business. And that is shocking. And it, and it speaks to this fact that we've, how systemic inequality has played out for years. Um, I, that, that I think COVID-19, you know, not only in from an economic perspective, but from a health perspective, is shining a light on disparities that exist largely around race uh, that have existed for centuries, existed for generations that is putting into stark reality right now. So I've been very proud of the Lieutenant Governor and the work that he's been doing on leading on COVID-19 health disparities. And frankly, this, Jim, is an example where we need to be uh, creating the exact same piece here to talk about COVID-19 economic disparities. What recently when the legislature passed uh, a bill to balance our current uh, fiscal year 20, uh, one of the pieces that we were able to do is produce a program that was talking about these business restart grants. Now, one of the places that I was a champion on, and I'm proud to have done this work, is to shift the focus. So we were prioritizing smaller businesses as opposed to larger businesses and saying that the, the program had a target goal of having at least 30% of those businesses be veteran, women, or minority owned. I'm not saying that that is a panacea to the problems, but it is saying that if we looked at how can we start being more intentional about making sure that, like you said, the banking relationship folks had wasn't the primary indicator of whether they would get the support they need. And by challenging and having these goals put out there, it actually then allows for folks to be more intentional about uh, doing the deep work and connecting with more communities, uh, more businesses and communities of color, more businesses owned by women and more businesses owned by veterans. But the other piece I wanna note here is, um, this is exactly the reason that we need strong enforcement of our non-discrimination laws. When we see patterns of decisions being made that are supposed to be in areas where you cannot discriminate based on race, uh, but yet, Statistically, this continues to then bear out in a different way. It begs the question, why are we not enforcing non-discrimination laws? And I'll say because it's been through decades of weakening of those protections uh, coming out of Congress, coming out of the state legislature, largely under Republican control on both. We can't, if we wanna make sure that, the, that everybody has equal justice under law, that we all have a shot to succeed or fail based on our merits, then we have to make sure that we're taking on strong action to enforce non-discrimination protections wherever they may be. But last but not least, I am proud, I've been in conversations to work with the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, MEDC, uh, and 
uh, in a bipartisan way and with uh, folks on both sides of the aisle. How can we start to be more intentional about making sure that access to entrepreneurship, access to state contracts, uh, echoing the great work of Governor Whitmer, goes to more Michigan-based companies that are inclusive and that we're bringing in not just the usual suspects, but l highlighting and lifting up small businesses, businesses that are owned by people of color to really then start changing this conversation. I'm excited. I have been doing that work. I will continue to do that work. And frankly, Congress could then uh, step up in a much larger way too if we have folks in Congress who are going to prioritize that. Thank you so much, Jim, and thanks, and, and thank, and 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 thank and thank you again, Representative Holtley. Uh, now I like to like like it like to introduce introduce Maureen Stroud, the uh, uh, ma the managing the principal and managing director of Shinka Sustainability Consultants, and, and she's going to going going to share some of her experience some of her experiences uh, in her current firm in her in her current position and her prior roles at, 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 at other large organizations, uh, working to remote sustainable business and climate leadership. Uh, Maureen? Thanks, Dan, and thanks for inviting me on to the panel. Hi, Representative Hoadley. Uh, my name is Maureen Stroud, and I, as Dan said, I'm the founder and managing director of Shinka Sustainability Consultants. Um, I've lived and worked in St. Joe and Benton Harbor communities since 2013 and have been a Michigan resident since 2011. Um, it's my passion to work in the fields of environmental science and climate change and being able to leverage the business community to be able to make a difference because I think there's a lot of power in the business community to pool resources and be able to make an impact on environmental issues. Um, I started Shinka Sustainability Consultants uh, last year um, and just getting my one year anniversary in the middle of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, that's been an interesting ride in uh, starting a business um, from a personal perspective. But I led, as Dan mentioned, I led the North America Sustainability Program at Whirlpool Corporation for six years prior to starting my own business. Um, and in my role there, I spent several years developing voluntary emissions credit to support carbon offsets programs. And I've spoken to several of your colleagues in Lansing over the years about energy and climate policy. Um, while Whirlpool was able to install on-site wind generation at several manufacturing facilities in Ohio, um, the progress toward additional programs has been, was slow and challenging, even though there had been a commitment to making progress on renewable energy. Um, they weren't successful with renewable energy installations in Michigan for the corporate office buildings and research centers for a variety of reasons. Um, there are many hurdles in making the transition to renewable energy on a corporate level due to zoning, tax and incentive structures, and net metering policies. Um, these hurdles make it difficult and add costs for businesses to navigate this process and the financial considerations for developing the renewable energy projects. Um, as you know, it can be challenging to advance climate leadership in a corporate environment due to uncertainty of many of these other policies in addition to renewable energy policies, as well as the lack of financial incentives for implementing carbon reduction programs. Um, programs like cap and trade program in California and in other countries globally um, can help to accelerate climate action because they provide a policy framework and financial incentives to encourage companies that can make carbon reductions um, in order to be able to sell those credits to other companies and organizations. Um, from that standpoint, a comprehensive climate action policy that includes mechanisms like the cap and trade program and other financial incentives would provide organizations with tools to develop opportunities to invest in additional programs that will result in carbon reductions and managing risks of climate change before it negatively impacts their business. Um, and it also helps organizations take a longer view um, even in the face of uh, issues with resiliency because they can better plan um, for a longer term future. Um, now that I'm in the capacity of leading Shinka Sustainability Consultants, um, we guide our clients on their path toward a more sustainable future uh, by taking into consideration the impacts on the environment and the communities where they do business. 
Um, part of the work that we do is working with organizations to understand climate risk, how it affects their business, and how they can mitigate that risk. Um, to help the business community to have more certainty of the regulatory landscape and to pr pr prioritize their efforts regarding climate change as we come out of um, these challenges with the pandemic and start to incorporate um, hopefully these aspects into uh, the future of business. It's helpful for me and probably the rest of the audience as well to understand your stance on the issue of climate change and the overarching regulatory landscape in Michigan. Well, before we jump into that, Maureen, congratulations on getting through your first year as a, in a business. <laughs> I know that that is a challenge, so congratulations. Yay. Um, I hope you have many more good years to come. Thank but you. But to your, to your question, let's talk about um, climate. And I loved your framing of this because what we know is that um, with, the, with the fossil fuel money, with the special interests that have purchased uh, so much influence and access, but um, what has happened is that we are seeing uncertainty in charting a path forward. Scientists are clear about the direction and the crisis of climate that we are facing. Businesses recognize that they're gonna have to deal with creating more resilient and sustainable businesses, but they're left with then inaction or contradictory action coming out of Republican-led legislatures. So we are dragging our feet uh, when we should be taking bold action and, begin, and then providing certainty moving forward. So when companies, when individuals, when organizations are thinking about making uh, significant capital investments, they've got some certainty about how that's going to play out in the long term. So let me start by being really clear. I believe the climate crisis is real. I think we have a shot clock about getting it right. And unfortunately, because of inaction that's happened over the last 10, 20, 30 years, you know, and unfortunately in our area, oftentimes under Congressman Fred Upton's leadership or lack thereof on addressing the climate crisis, we've got ourselves a situation where we have got to make a significant bold change now so we are prepared to move forward for generations to come. And so, you know, I've supported a number of uh, policy changes that would help us set more concrete goals in the state, help us individuals and businesses be incentivized to take action on uh, clean energy. But all of those sort of pieces come together and saying that, yeah, we need a comprehensive and sustainable plan. And then we need to stick with it. You know, when, when President Trump pulled out of the Paris Accords, um, it really was a shock to the markets and to other places, because what should have been long-term uh, predictability in guiding where we were going was then stopped and reversed. Now, fortunately, we've had a number of um, other leaders like Governor Whitmer step up and join with the US Climate Alliance to take action that they were still gonna work um, through a coalition of mayors and governors and other leaders to take action on the climate crisis. But, that is the type of uncertainty that you were talking about. And we can't keep making policy flip-flops because the climate crisis is moving forward regardless of whether some policymakers wanna put their head in the sand. So I'm ready to take bold action. You know, I would love to see more green jobs right here in Southwest Michigan, jobs that can't be outsourced or offshored, you know, and strategic investments that are gonna be benefiting and rebuilding all of Southwest Michigan so we can actually make sure that we have access to, uh, you know, green infrastructure. And at the same time, you know, use it as an opportunity to, to build back even better. Maybe that's expanding access to rural broadband as we're replacing sewer and water pipes. Maybe it's um, looking at where we're gonna be laying additional infrastructure to harness clean energy sources and at the same time, looking at ways that we're going to uh, encourage green jobs to co-locate with those. So I'm excited about it. Um, and I'm, you know, I think that's the type of, we need to be bold and consistent and I'm ready to work with you on getting that done. I have one more quick question. Um, it's along those same lines. Do you expect that we'll see a climate action plan from the state of Michigan this year? And then what role do you see the federal government playing in helping the community respond to climate change? I do not expect that the legislature is gonna put forth the climate action plan. However, 
um, you know, between the work that's happening at uh, the Department of Energy uh, uh, at Eagle, you know, um, Energy, Great Lakes and the Environment, the work that's happening under the governor's leadership, um, I do know that they are working on making sure that uh, we put those signals in place that then for all the folks who are trying to have some predictability um, that they're going to see where we want policy to go. But, but I would say this, elections have consequences. And that's why for all the folks that are watching this, I would encourage you to make sure that you are, your voter registration is up to date, that you've talked about why the environment and sustainability matters to you. Because you know, we are in a moment where we were going to have elections on November 3rd. People are gonna start voting in just a few days because uh, ballots will be available in most of Michigan on September 24th. So find the candidates that are supporting your stance on sustainability. You know, go talk to the folks that are running and folks that care and share these values with you because votes will be cast and then decisions will be made that won't just impact the next two years but potentially the next 20 years or 200 years because of the urgency of the choices that need to be made. And so I'm hopeful that we're going to elect a series of environmental champions over in November that could then help us build a strong climate action plan here in the state that will support the work that the governor is doing and others. Um, and that frankly will turn around uh, the direction that our country chose uh, in terms of sustainability in the environment over the last few years and make us once again a leader for the world, uh, both morally, economically, and environmentally. Thank you so much, Maureen, and thank you, and thank you, thank you again, John. So we have a uh, we, we have a few questions with uh, with with the time we have left here. Uh, uh, first one, uh, Marta, John Marta Johnson, who's on, uh, who, uh, is 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 going to read a question, and then we have, uh, depending on that, we have time. We have uh, additional questions around the net metering law in Michigan and recycling. Uh, uh, Marta, you go 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 ahead with your question. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm Marta and I work currently with the American Sustainable Business Council um, and we work on the intersection between a high road economy and a, a climate positive um, economy and um, supporting uh, innovation and a thriving business community. I've worked on climate policy for many years from uh, 2007 when we had a divided government in Michigan um, working on net metering and other um, energy related policies um, to 2008 when there um, was a, a unified um, branches of government under the Democratic Party. Um, I work with a nonpartisan organization. We've come up and I'll plop it in the chat here. We've come up with some really um, uh, great recommendations on COVID response and integrating it with issues that we see are critical for all of our futures, but also for the future of businesses. Um, and in light of all of this, you know, we have an election coming up and we are in the midst of a divided government. I'm really curious, um, Representative Hoadley, on your ideas on, on how amidst divisions, um, we can effectively meet the moment for climate change and uh, address um, concerns that we all share about having a thriving small business and um, innovative uh, economy. Oh, I appreciate that. And just one small correction is that we've actually never had unified democratic control of government for over 40 years in the state of Michigan. So I would, I don't want anyone to be, the Senate has yeah. stayed in Republican control. Uh, for I meant, right, federal, federally in 2008, we had, yeah. we had that, but not in the states. So sorry about that. Yeah, no, I just want to be clear because um, sometimes I get questions from voters or constituents who say, why haven't you done X, Y, or Z things? and because there is a political process. You know, one thing I think is important to recognize is that there's been asymmetrical political polarization, particularly around issues of climate. And so unfortunately, we've seen folks uh, on the Republican side of the aisle, uh, and not all rank and file Republicans, but uh, a number of folks move further to the right, which makes it harder to find uh, compromise around us moving towards a clean energy and sustainable environmental future moving forward. And so I just wanna recognize that moving uh, this piece here. But you know, that being said, um, I think even in divided government, there are opportunities to make progress. So it's important that people are building relationships with all of their elected officials around issues that matter. 
you one of the stories I tell is as we watched in uh, when we talked about the net metering conversation that happened uh, at the last time we renewed the Michigan Energy Plan, and you know it was an interesting uh, group of folks who wanted to some folks who wanted to see energy freedom because of marketplace principles, other folks who wanted to see net metering because of the sustainability and potential for increased environmental benefits. But we, but there was a, a, and I was proud to be a part of that, that there was a group of us that cut across party lines to then come at the debate from a different perspective and shift policy. But that happened because of relationships and because of the long work that's been happening over time. Unfortunately, we're seeing inaction oftentimes because of money and politics which is why it's important that all of these issues are connected and people are paying attention. However, for folks that care about the environment, I'd say don't give up hope. Um, your conversations can make an impact. Find the folks that are willing to listen and lead then on those issues and make sure you keep supporting them, both at the ballot box and throughout their legislative careers. John. John, we have a minute or two left. Do you, do you have any quick thoughts on recycling before, uh, bef bef as we wrap up here? Yeah, we need more of it. Um, just real quick on recycling. It is not the end all be all uh, you know, way to solve our climate crisis or the environment, but hey, it's a part of it. I'm someone that has been opposed to the fact that we've been continuing to subsidize our landfills um, without making sure that we're supporting our environmental and our recycling programs. Um, I want to see the state of Michigan be a leader in the space again. We've given up our mantle here, you know, from symbolic and uh, at the times innovative programs like the bottle bills, which I've been an advocate of expanding to the fact that uh, we, you know, we have a renewed Michigan program that isn't even being paid for out of sustainable funds. It is, uh, we're at a moment where recycling and the issues around recycling can step up to the forefront. So. Um, I want to see us spend and invest more in those types of programs. They're great for local business. It's local jobs. It's great for our local industries. Um, and, you know, I think it's a space where we can reclaim some of that leadership. Thank you. And, and, uh, uh, and the last open question we have is on net metering. I, I, I don't want to take up any more of your time necessary today, but if, if it's a quick answer, pl pl please feel free. Otherwise, uh, maybe we can follow up with you if, if you have a specific position on that. Oh, um, and I think this is coming from Dan Vandenheed, who is a fantastic candidate who's running for state representative um, and uh, down in the 78th district. And mm -hmm. to net metering, we have seen changes to that program. Uh, it was part of the compromise in terms of what rates would ultimately be used. But I think there is a larger conversation about wanting to expand, review, and renew net metering because uh, we built a bipartisan coalition around trying to strengthen those programs. And with so much innovation being unlocked through entrepreneurship in this space, you know, let's make sure that we're supporting those small businesses that are leading in clean energy production and installation, because that's jobs that we can have right here that won't be outsourced or offshored. And kudos to you for getting in that last question with a minute, with a, with a, with a, with a minute left in our program today. Uh, thank you so much to Representative, uh, Representative, uh, Rep, Representative Hoadley uh, for taking the time to, uh, time to speak with us today. Uh, good luck on your campaign in the, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the final months here. Uh, thank you also to, also, also, also to our panelists and for all of our attendees for joining us. Uh, we, do, we, we are currently scheduling a, a similar session with uh, Fred Upton as well in the, in the coming weeks, so please keep an eye out for that. Uh, and we and, and we and we hope, uh, regardless of the outcome of the election, that we uh, see a, see a, see, a, see a lot more of uh, Laura John, uh, more of John's efforts in uh, uh, in in Southwest Michigan, whatever capacity that uh, that might be. Uh, again, thank you so much, John, and uh, thank you to our panelists, and thank you for our attendees. That's that's all we have today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, John. Thanks. Thank you. It's a pleasure. All right, thank you everyone. All right, thank you again, Simon. You're welcome, thank you.